Welcome everybody. This is a NGWA industry connected video on the topic of technical specifications, how to uh, consider their verbiage, meaning, and uh, enforcement of technical specifications. So my name is Marvin Glapfelty. I'm a hydrogeologist in uh, Arizona and uh, also a licensed well driller in Arizona. And uh, so I wanted to talk about technical specifications because um, I, uh, you may know I uh, wrote a book on well design, The Art of Water Wells, and that is just on the design part. Uh, very important, but it can be rendered meaningless unless we can implement it. And our method to do that is the technical specifications. It's sort of the recipe of how to install the well that we've designed. So like with well design itself, the purpose of the well, the scope of the project, is it a big one or just a little um, household well? Big difference. And so a technical specification can be a single sheet of paper or it can be a 50 page or 100 page document. It really makes a big difference. So what I'll be referring to today is the higher end, you know, with more detail, maybe for a municipality, a power plant. Uh, 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 an agricultural well, something large that's going to produce maybe several thousand gallons per minute. That, of course, can be toned down and should be toned down appropriate to each project. So one of the first things that we'll uh, talk about is definitions. Uh, definition of who are the involved parties. You have regulators, you have the uh, technical people, engineers and or hydrogeologists. You have the well owners, which may be different than those people. You have the driller, and that might be a direct contract or it might be a subcontract through a general contractor. So you have a number of individuals involved. Who are they? What is their responsibilities? And what is their authority? And so we need to define all this stuff, and that's important. So we do that, and then uh, that's that's part of the initial clause, and um, and then. Um, we want to talk about industry standards. Well, we don't need to get into a lot of rhetoric about industry standards in a technical specification, but we want to know that the driller shows, demonstrates that they're licensed, that they have the health and safety requirements covered, that they have the appropriate equipment. They're not going to come with a, for example, a cable tool rig when we expect them to show up with a dual rotary rig. Two different methods. Maybe they can both work, but it's, it needs to be what's expected, what was what was um, bought into. So, uh, and a lot of these are going to be in a low bid scenario. So we need to think about the different phases of the project. There has to be, there should be a level playing field when we have a bidding process. That means that many times, for example, municipalities they have a mandate to select the low bid if it's a qualified bid. So we need to be sure that the, the technical specifications define what qualified is so that all bids are on a level playing field and the low ones would be the appropriate ones to select just based on cost. That's not a good way to play the game. We all agree to that, but it's what's real. It's what's really out there. So we accommodate it as best we can with technical specs. In other scenarios, maybe just selected drillers who are more highly qualified or are selected in a, by private entities and then there's a, a competition between them. Even in that case, you want to have a level playing field. So uh, we, we talk about industry standard equipment, health and safety requirements, and things like that. Um, in technical specifications, it's not just the method and the material and how to drill the well. We have to also accommodate the overall program. So that means we've got neighbors. A lot of times we're in a, a residential neighborhood. So that means sound abatement, uh, traffic control. Where are we going to discharge fluids? Will we be flooding some washes that children could be playing in? Or maybe there's homeless people living in there. We have to think about these things. Uh, we need to require sound abatement, you know, uh, sound abatement walls. Uh, sometimes eight, they come in eight foot panels, in my experience. So eight, 16, or 24. Usually it's a 16 or 24 foot wall. So that's got to be considered, and how are we going to put them in? Some drillers like to use um, shipping containers. And they, if they have the room, they stack them up. Well, that looks pretty industrial, and so sometimes that upsets the, the neighborhood. 
or just conventional walls, which aren't exactly lovely, but they're less industrial looking than shipping containers stacked up. So it can go either way. Um, a lot of different things in there are ASTM standards that we can call for them to meet in terms of decibel monitoring. Uh, I've done decibel monitoring on numerous occasions and even on a couple of occasions, seismic monitoring. There can be people complain about uh, about uh, vibration. So if we need to do it, we're prepared to do it. Um, so um, when we write up our technical specifications, we should be very critical and have a, a team of people, new sets of human eyes looking at the same document to determine what is uh, the best procedure. And we can, we can call for a task in two different ways. We can call for the result, make something happen. We want to have a well that produces this much water of this quality. Make it happen, however you do it. Or we can call for the process. Drill with this bit of this size, with this weight on the bit and all that. If, we, if you call for the process, you really need to know what you're talking about. Don't just make something up and try to, because you're not, if, if you're not a driller, if you're telling the driller how to do their job, you are taking responsibility and you need to be aware of that. So that's, uh, that's the process and the result is the other option you can do. Um, we call for um, a number of clauses that, uh, that are, uh, are important to the uh, technical specifications. One of them is record keeping. And I want to show you a, uh, a, uh, a little cheat sheet that we use in my firm. This is uh, called a driller submittal list. Uh, and what it is, it's, it's, you see it has an asterisk here. And so at the bottom of this list, we say this is, you know, refer to the technical specification. This is just to help you out. But we give this to our people, we give this to the driller, and it seems to be helpful. So we, we say what the item is. So this first one would be in their bid, we're asking for them to give us some other client references. And where we, and this is in detail what it is, uh, when it's due, who you give it to. Um, in this case, uh, they would give it to a general contractor. In other cases, they might give it directly to the design professional, which is the well designer. Where it is in the tech spec on what page, and then a little check mark when you, when you, when you receive it. So we go through all kinds of different things that are all really required throughout the process. This might be uh, material samples or filter pack or maybe mill certs of casing and screen. Um, here's penetration rate log, uh, all kinds of different things that may be required. There's a long list and the driller is busy. They're putting a well in so they can easily forget this. And our people are busy logging cuttings and, and inspecting materials and they might forget. So that's where this is just handy and can easily be uh, used to, uh, to uh, as a kind of a cheat sheet to, to get back to, uh, you know, what we're, uh, what we're really requiring. So um, with that, I'll uh, go on to, uh, you know, some of the specific clauses that we require that you might want to just, you know, keep in mind because every single clause, every single word in a technical specification should be there for a reason. We don't want to preach to anybody. Now, why would we do that? They need to be there for a reason. And so uh, here's some clauses that I would uh, advocate for in, you know, when appropriate in most cases though. One would be a loss circulation clause. If loss circulation occurs, then uh, that, that's where the drilling fluid that's stabilizing the borehole seeps into a fracture, maybe porous gravel or fractured rock real fast. So they don't, they aren't able to return cuttings to the surface. And that means that uh, they, they may have the borehole collapse in on them. They don't want that. So uh, that means that you, sh you have, you have uh, changed conditions. So we usually advocate switching from linear foot payment basis to hourly payment basis, plus some kind of compensation for lost of circulation materials. So that's the materials that are used added to the drilling fluid to stabilize the borehole. Um, we, we define this. So this just doesn't go into effect whenever they encounter it. It has to be specifically defined conditions and um, they have to notify, in our case, the hydrogeologist um, with, you know, before this clause ever goes into effect. And if we all agree, yeah, we're in lost circulation conditions, 
then we're immediately in uh, the hourly rather than the footage basis. Now, in the real world, what happens sometimes is you go in and out and in and out of loss circulations. You have a little bit of loss, you get it under control. You drill a little deeper, it happens again, and so on and so forth. So we need to be able to accommodate that in our clause, and we do. Um, another one that's uh, pretty similar is low penetration. It can happen for a couple of reasons. You can be in very hard rock, or you can be in a sticky clay. Either one slows you down. So we require uh, a couple of things to be sure that it is active nature, not something that's avoidable by the driller. One is a reasonable amount of weight on the bit. So we say 1,500 pounds per diameter inch. I know that that's applicable and reasonable for a large diameter rotary bit. I actually don't know off the top of my head whether that is the, the weight you'd want to use for a smaller bit, whether it's rotary, and certainly something like cable tool or hammer, that's not applicable. But uh, we, there, we, we have that and then we leave the option for ourselves to have them trip the drill bit out of the hole so that we can inspect it and make sure that it's a problem with the formation, not a problem with the equipment. So. Uh, but there again, if you have low penetration, it's not the driller's fault, they're doing everything they can reasonably, then, then they can switch from footage to hourly. So from the well owner standpoint, they're thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to pay more money, why would I want to do these clauses? Well, it's because if you don't include these clauses, the driller, if they're smart, smart businessmen, are going to protect themselves. And so you're going to be paying for that, whether it happens or not, it's going to be buried in their mobilization cost, you won't even know it's there. So you really want to include these. And there's a third clause that I advocate, and this is because I was an expert witness one time for a unfortunate situation in uh, Colorado where um, the driller did everything right. They encountered uh, difficult drilling conditions. And they did everything right. So the records were very clear on that. Um, and so at the end of the job, they hit the client with a huge change order request. The client fought them on it and all went to court, which is where you really don't want to be. Nobody wins, but the lawyers there. So what I have is an unexpected problems clause. That means if there's something that's not covered by the law circulation clause and not covered by the penetration clause, but it's a delay, it's going to cost more money, something changed, something happened, and everybody would agree to it, then the driller is obliged to basically give a a burn rate for the additional monies uh, right up right up from that point going forward. So they need to, to just contact uh, the owner and the hydrogeologist and say, here's the additional monies that I'm, I'm, I'm incurred. You know, something happened and, and I have additional uh, burden here. And everybody says, oh, so they agree at the time before all the work's done. And so there's not going to be a, a bickering over payment or non-payment. It's going to happen. And so that's, what you're, that's, that's what's best for everybody, best for the project. And so in all these technical specification verbiages, the thing that we're thinking about is worst case scenarios. We write technical specifications for the poorest performing contractor, for the worst conditions, for, you know, we, we cover what ifs. And that's what we want to do. They won't need to be implied, but, the, but what you want to be able to do is write a good type, detailed technical specification and then hold the contractor to it to the letter. That means that you're being fair to the bidders that weren't the low bid, that, that would have been able to do exactly what you said. You need to expect the driller that did win the bid to also do exactly what you said. So that's fair to everybody and fair to the well owner. You know, they'll pay what they need to pay and not a, a dime more. So that's the, that's what your job is. Um, I, I didn't mention that materials need to be detailed. You don't just when I first started in this business about uh, 37 years ago, technical specifications would always say that the well has to be round and true. What is round and true? I, I mean, round, yeah, kind of round, kind of, is it oval or is it how round is round? And true, I don't even know what that means. So, uh, you know, that not for, not for a well. Anyway, so um, rather than get into vague stuff, we need to be detailed. Plumness and alignment clauses. Some of them are unreasonable that I've seen uh, that are that exceed even what a gyroscopic survey is capable of measuring. Wells don't need to have that that level of plumbness and alignment. There, there's not a requirement for vertical turbine line shaft tur turbine pumps. There's a reasonable level, and that should be called for. 
And so the AWWA A100 standard is a good one to, to default to. Many different uh, standards are out there. ASTM, uh, National Sanitation um, Foundation, so on. NGWA has a lot of, of, uh, of work, uh, worksheets on that. So there's a lot of good information. And then when it's a, appropriate, you can just reference it. So that's my uh, that's my my preaching on technical specifications.